Hey, it's Tracy Hazard back on New Trust Economy, and I am really excited to bring you somebody who I've gotten to, to know over time because we've interviewed a few times, and I absolutely adore him, Mark S.A. Smith from the, uh, I almost said from the New Trust Economy, from Bija Company, and you have a podcast called The Selling Disruption Show. And I love the idea of selling disruption because there can't be anything more disruptive right now than what's going on in blockchain. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as all sorts of things that he's been working on over the years. Because you've been working in technology, Mark, since 1982. That's exactly right. right. So my first disruptive product in 1982. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, that's a that's you know, I'm, I'm a little behind you. I'm about a decade behind, but so I've been working around it since 1992. And, but you know, this is the thing you've always had sort of an executive focus on it and you run these executive strategy summits, which we definitely want to talk about as we're going forward. But I think that, you know, each time that you've been faced up against this, the technology and selling disruption and moving into these organizations, you're coming up with the same conversations with customers again and again. Like it's, it's similar. It, it's the same pattern of it. It doesn't matter what the technology is. So That's let's right. talk a lot about that today. So Mark, I want you to tell a little bit about how you did get started in technology and what kind of technology you got started back with. Well, it's really simple. I, I started by accident. I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering in 1982. Of course, I was expecting to design things and create electronic stuff. And HP hired me out of college. And that was back in the days when Hewlett Packard hired engineers to be involved in the world of sales because it was a peer-to-peer -peer sales strategy. And I was thrown into this factory where we were selling the next generation of test and measurement equipment that nobody knew that they needed. And they were doing it the old-fashioned way. And we had this whole cool way of pushing a button and automating most of the measurements. And so when you're up against that kind of a scenario, you have to teach people not about how you do it, but what the outcome is. And I what their benefit is, what the, yeah, what they're going to get from it. That's exactly right. How do you lower, radically lower the cost of how you're doing it right now is a, is a great approach to taking when you're selling disruptive technology. And of course, the benefit behind, behind all disruptive technology is once you have this new approach in your business, you're not going to go back to the old approach. And that's what creates the disruption is the, the status quo is no longer the same. Right, we've all changed our, our systems, changed our processes, changed our paradigms around. I mean, this is, you and I have talked about this in 3D printing many, many times because that's a lot of my disruption experiences in. And, you know, that we don't prototype the same way we did 20 years ago. Oh, it's no. never been the same since we got introduced to it. Indeed. And in fact, prototyping is frequently done as a simulation in software before we ever move into meat space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the exactly. real thing. Exactly. So, you know, this is, we're headed into this difficulty of corporate climates, I think, where you've got to sell within your corporation when you want to move into new technology, because they're like on technology overload, as if we all aren't everywhere else too, but they're on technology overload in a lot of companies, it, whether it's a startup, um, a growth stage, or, you know, you're talking about Fortune 500s, they're all in kind of this overwhelm of technology. That's right. And the people who are going to decide whether or not to fund your project are looking at it through a completely different lens than you are as a technologist enamored with the how you're going to accomplish it. With the new shiny object. That's exactly <laughs> right. What that means is if you're going to sell your tactical deployment, you have to be good at selling the strategy. And that really is the reason why I'm here to share with you the, the thoughts behind how do you create the strategic story that gets the people who will cut loose the checks to agree to what you're saying. And so you have to be able to speak their strategic language. You know, it's interesting. I was doing an interview with Sherry Ami, um, and she was talking the same thing. She was working with more of uh, startups who need to pitch people, right? And so it's not all that different from how you have to pitch investors. You really have to change your language around what's in it for them and whether that is what's in it for them from an investment standpoint or what's in it from them from a corporate growth standpoint. And, and really the whole idea here is you have to show them that your idea, when they add money, will generate money. Mm -hmm. And so it's that process that you're going to go through. And you know, they look at a lot of pitches. And, and we can talk about this from an internal funding standpoint or an external funding standpoint. It really doesn't matter. Investors all have the same vision in mind, which is, number one, can I get my investment back? And number two, can I make money from the investment? And it's in that order, by the way. <laughs> yeah, risk first, then growth, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. 
And, and so from that standpoint, you have to show them that your idea is one that's going to generate money and also is manageable. And keep in mind that no executive will ever agree to a project that they don't know how to manage. Ah, that's a really interesting thought about it. You know, it, it's, that's a much more internal thinking because I, from an external, from an investor thinking, you're thinking, is this a team that can manage it? Like, so you have a team perspective, not a process perspective. Well, frequently they go after the team because the team has a process or a system that has proven that they can create the outcome that they promise. And yet in every case, you're still going to have timelines and milestones and places where you're going to uh, drop tranches of money in the case of an investor to fund that next phase. But investors are always going to look for a phased approach as a way of minimizing their losses <laughs> and maximizing their gains. So, you know, you start off with a, a research phase and then you go to a, an alpha phase. And, and that's why people go through these various rounds of funding Right, is, is an attempt to, to limit that. And what I want people in the world of blockchain to think about is, all right, what is the strategy behind what we're bringing to market? And how is this going to make our investors and our customers money? Yeah, you know, it, it, Monica and I have been talking a little bit about it. Sometimes we get in that, as we referred to it earlier, a little shiny object syndrome going on in that we think blockchain is the answer for everything, or at least many, many companies are presenting it as the answer for everything. And there really is no reason to put it on the blockchain. Yes, it might be easier to manage, but it's also going to be more costly in the short term. So can you prove out your concept in a more traditional way and then say, hey, when we've got the blockchain research and we figured out what we, how we're going to structure it and how we're going to do it, now we can drop it right into there and make it a more simple management and more transparent solution like we always wanted it to be. So let me share with you the, the, my five Vs to okay. establish whether a, a project is relevant to blockchain. <laughs> oh, awesome, Mark. I knew you'd be bringing, oh. some, I knew you'd be bringing me some letters because we, we talk about P's a lot in our other, yeah, in our that's other right. process. <laughs> that's exactly. We've, we've done the P thing. Now we're going to do the V thing. I love it. So, so the, 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 first of all, let's take a look at the business model. If it's a business model that relies on transactions or information and it requires that it be validated, verified, the veracity the volume, and the velocity. Love it. Those are the five areas where blockchain brings real value. Let me say those again. Validation. Okay, is it, is it um, what we say it's going to be? Veracity. In, in this particular case, it might be a history. It might be um, a, a genealogy where we need to illustrate the, the serial numbers that were put inside of a, a unit before it was shipped out. So I can go back and say, yes, this is, we shipped it. Now the, the verification, these are the things that were put in it. And that prevents, for example, uh, warranty fraud. Mm. Now, for example, warranty fraud can run as high as 10 or 20% in a lot of organizations. Well, you can kill that immediately with a blockchain type of verification. Next is you know, veracity. And what I really mean for, by veracity is, is everything, rec is, is everything recognized the way that we want it to be? And is there, um, in that particular case, what I look is, is really for the, um, in, in the world of wine and the terroir, you know, where, where does it come from and, and how deep do we need to go? Yeah, well, of course, here we call it, is there trust in that data, right? So can Indeed. we believe it's not, it's not been corrupted or modified, or is there some amount of truth in that? And that's where veracity comes in. So. And, and it could even be a chain of blockchains where we're going to connect to the blockchain system of our vendors mm -hmm. so that we can illustrate uh, that, that genealogy is, is probably good, another good way of saying it. Of course, volume. The higher the volume, uh, the more valuable blockchain comes, and then velocity. If you're looking for something that has a high speed, a blockchain can do that. And I think all of those areas are going to benefit substantially from a blockchain type of deployment. Yeah, and, and this is the thing, though, that I, you know, like I, I go check, check, check. All of this is checking off with the business plan that model that we've been working towards, which is why we got into this blockchain world in, in the first place um, over on our podcast business side. And so I've talked about that with the audience before, so they're kind of familiar with the basics of what, what we're looking at. But the reality is, is that we can also start to do that in, as a test model 
now. So we can test whether or not that's like, we think veracity matters. We think truth in the data matters. We can test that out with where we are today by exploring it and, and making, I'm going to call them principles that we're applying to how we're delivering our data and how we're providing that to advertisers or how we're providing that back to our podcasters. And if they don't believe the data, then we have a problem. Now That's exactly right. we need blockchain as a solution. So now we're right about the solution. So verifying those things along the way is also really important because blockchain is a time consuming, it, it, putting it in place is time consuming and to have to build it and then expect to get that feedback later and find out you didn't even need it, that you're, you were right about this, but your market didn't believe that. Now you're in trouble. Oh yeah. It's, it's so true. <laughs> and, and it, um, a couple of ideas here that, that just kind of popped into play. You know, one is, as Scott Adams pointed out, if cheating has value and the probability or risk of getting caught is low, there's a 100% probability that somebody's cheating. Right. <laughs> and that's the perfect application for blockchain. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. And so um, the other aspect that you pointed out is, is this something that we can... Um, we can predict whether this is going to be valuable or not. And I actually have a, I have a chart for you. Ooh, I love it. We're going to put up here. This is the profit equation. So for those of you who are listening, I will make sure that this is in the blog post for this episode at the New Trust Economy, um, newtrustaconomy.com. And we'll make sure it's up there so you can see the profit equation. Oh, I love it. And the profit okay. equation, thank you. And the profit equation, equation consists of three components. Number one is, is it scarce? Number two, is it desirable? Number three, is it necessary? And if you have all three of those, then you'll have consistent profits, as you can see in the, the Venn diagram that I've put up. And if it's scarce and desirable, but not necessary, then it becomes a luxury. And there's a lot of things in the world of blockchain that are that. Yeah. Scarce, but desirable, but not necessarily necessary. If it's scarce and necessary, then it becomes essential, like a banking function. And that's gonna, there's not going to be a lot of profit there because a lot of people are going to be playing. Then if it's desirable and necessary, but not scarce, that becomes a commodity. There's not a lot of money to be made there either. But if you can identify that you have a, a, an application that's both desirable, necessary, and scarce, then you've got a winning combination to make profit. Is that a helpful insight? Oh, definitely, Mark. I love it. You know, and then we talk about this. We talk about it. It's your unique, your, your unique value. When when you talk about something being scarce, it's having that unique value, but having that unique va value be desirable. Those those two things are magic in the product world that I work in, and in whatever service sources. You know, whether you're talking about services or products. That's the magic we look for. And then, of course, on the other side of that, we want it to be necessary. Everybody needs it, but that's not always the case. You're right well, about and, that. And necessity changes over time because right. what was once desirable becomes necessary. A really good example of that are, are these mobile devices that we have. You know, they've only been around for about 11 years or so. And, Which you know, shocks me, right? Doesn't it shock you? It's only yeah. 11. Only 11 years. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what at one time was desirable, now you have, you know, five-year-olds with their own iPhone 10. Yeah, we're having a debate. My 10-year-old is insisting that 10 is the right age. <laughs> her, her cousin is, was held out till 12, so the, the overall family would like it to be 12, and my daughter's like, no, that's not, I'm not waiting. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not necessary. In which case, you can, you can say, okay, contribute to the, the purchase power. And <laughs> I, mean, I, yeah. raised five, I raised five kids and the household rule was all mobile devices live at the top of the stairs once bedtime arrives. We used to make, her, we used to make my oldest put it outside the door so we yeah. could just glance down the hallway and it was there. We were good. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I'm sure by the time we closed the door, it was back in our room, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, trust and verify. We, we did that, yeah. So I actually have a really, it's just on a side note, we have this really good friend, John Riley, and they have two Wi-Fis. So like they're, they're, they're split and he shuts, and one actually turns off at 9 p.m. at night. And they have to have permission to, if the homework has to last or, you know, because they're high school students. But yep, that's yeah, it. We, would, we, we would do that as well. Wi-Fi just, just went away at, <laughs> at a particular time and Aren't we getting, aren't we getting funny about it? Well, let's talk a little bit about these executive strategy summits that you, that you produce, because I mean, how many have you done now? Uh, six. The seventh one is in a month. Wow. And I, you know, I have some friends who've gone to them with you and, and you do. Yeah, Betsy went. 
And so that's that's right. So Betsy Westhaver, one of my really good friends went and that's how I got introduced to you right after one actually. So yeah, tell me a little bit about how they work. Tell us all. We were really, I'm really curious about what, what you try to accomplish in these. All right. Really, it's, it's, uh, it's really quite straightforward. Uh, This is grown out of the work that I've done with executives over the past 29 years. And through my experience of coaching them, working with them, helping to figure out how to grow their businesses, I've learned that executives have a very different mindset, tool set, and skill set than an entrepreneur or a manager. Their world outlook, their worldview is very different. So what I've done is pulled together what I consider to be the critical aspects of being a business leader, being an executive leader. Leadership is not leadership is not leadership. The way you lead uh, a, a spiritual organization is very different than the way you lead a military organization is very different than you lead an entrepreneurial organization is very different than you lead an organization that is built for scaling. Ah, uh, yes. And so I have pulled out what those differences are and identified that there's a skill stack that's required for you to successfully run a sustainable, scalable, profitable, and ultimately saleable business. And everything I teach contributes to those four elements. And they are, that is roughly in the correct order. You can have a profitable business that's not sustainable. Right. Well, that's not a business. You can't sell. And you can have a scalable business that's not sustainable or profitable, in which case it's not a saleable business. So we work on the, the skill set and, more importantly, the mindset. And what we talk about, which freaks a lot of people out, are things that are never discussed outside of the C-suite. They're actually politically incorrect. Oh. And if the, if the average worker on the front line knew what was discussed in the C-suite, they would be disgusted. Well, that's why we have a lot of problems when uh, emails get, uh, you know, <laughs> subpoenaed, right? <laughs> they do. Right. They do. And, and a lot of that can be eliminated once people understand what's standing behind those discussions. And it has to do with that, the fact that the people on the front line and one or two levels up don't have the capacity to see as far into the future as is required by an executive who is guiding the company to where the customer money will be in the future. And if they knew those plans, it would freak them out because they'd say, there's no way. That, no, there's no way we could ever do that. Well, well, keep in mind that an executive is creating a future that does not yet exist using methods that have not yet been invented where best practices have yet been established have not yet been established. And blockchain right now is fitting into that for a lot of companies. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the thing, uh, the part of the problem is we've, we talked about the idea of, of us partnering together here, mm-hmm. Monica and I, with you um, and other partners to, to do a blockchain specific, a niche strategy um, yes. executive summit. And, you know, the idea is that there's a lot of unknowns because, you know, here I am, I've been looking at it and saying, okay, I see that this blockchain application, it, we cover all your V's and mm-hmm. I, you know, and it, so it's, it's viable. We're actually building a, the, I'm going to call it the beta version of it off the blockchain now. And it's already proving itself for at least two thirds of it. The other third we're going to build in the next year. And so we're, we're but I have to start thinking, and that's my job because I'm the CEO now. Actually, I, we just swapped roles. I am now the CEO and Tom is now the CTO. So All right. Swapped roles, yeah, because of this, because someone has to sit back and look at this vision and make the decisions about how are we going to go into this? Who's going to partner with us? What does this look like? What team do we need? What, what money do we need? What do we need to make this happen? Because it now looks like it, it's, it's very viable and it's actually very necessary for us to do this. Mm-hmm. So, and and, and that is scarce. a lonely job, right? It's scary. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is scary. Right, because well, I'm in a family business, so it's a little scarier when you can't when your frontline people are in the same office as you and you can't always talk to them. So I agree with you. This has to happen somewhere where you have people you can talk to who are going through the same thing. Indeed, that's exactly the, the situation. And so, in, in the Executive Strategy Summit, not only do we work on mindset and skill set and tool set, but we also build out a business plan. Everybody walks away with a refreshed single sheet business plan. Side one is strategy, which is the what and why. And that's mapped completely to your personal motivation. If you cannot run a business or are not running a business out of your personal motivation, it, it'll fail. Right. It just, it absolutely will fail. And then the other side of the, uh, the business plan are the tactics. How are we going to get this done? And the reason why one sheet's 
important is because if it's more than that, nobody looks at it. This is something you pull out every Monday morning and you take a look, make sure that you're on track. Then we also give people the tools to decide exactly where to focus their attention. And we do that with a set of key performance indicators for the most important aspects of the business. There's 11 of them. And one of them is personal satisfaction. And the reason why is because if you're not personally satisfied, this thing's going to blow up. It's unsustainable. It, yeah, so, it's a key to sustainability. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Know, that is that is so so true. And you know, I think that's really interesting that um, that you've tied it because there is are so few. I'm going to call them executive style summits or leadership summits where they're either all personal or they're all really corporate professional and they, they separate the two. But mm -hmm. today, so many of us are building our own businesses and they've gotten up to a level. And I mean, at the end of the day, if I, if I can't, you know, have time with my kids, then why am I doing this? No, it's no, a question right. you, you sit back on, you know, and think. Well, and, and for that reason, we have companies that come through uh, that we have executives that are in, that are in companies and fortune 500 companies, and they come through to get themselves primed for a promotion because they know how to speak C-suite language when they're done. And we have others that have come in, gone through the class and go, nope, I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to start my own company instead. Now I know how to run a company that I think can work. And, and part of it is you have to create that balance of what your life looks like because after all, work is here to, to first to generate the lifestyle of our desire. Yeah, so if yeah. we're not doing that, we gotta we have to sit back and think. But you know, that's really interesting. So, you know, I I always loved being in a big corporation. Like I I, I loved the C suite. I loved being a part of the management structure. It it energized me. The being able to have that infrastructure and support under you was really great. Tom, the opposite. He mm -hmm. was like, I was meant to be an entrepreneur. This is the life for me. And which is actually why we've we've been able to partner up over the years really well. But you're it it takes all kinds within a company to be able to make it run and make it scalable Indeed. and saleable. So I think these are keys that, you know, you're really also helping them identify, am I up for this? Yes. And do I have the right team for this? As you just pointed out. Yeah. And the reality is your team has to have a broad mix of skills and abilities and worldviews for you to put together a scalable organization. And, and here's an important concept. You have to hire people you don't like to do jobs you don't like. <laughs> the people that are very opposite and different from you. Yes. Indeed. It's absolutely critical. Otherwise, no, it's going to be a dysfunctional organization. Yeah. And so Tom and I were lucky enough. We, we have our daughter who is um, our operations manager and she thinks in, in to-do lists and process and like process flow. And I can think that way, but it's not where I'm, I'm like not in my element there. I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not my, it would be like the thing I would procrastinate about, but I would get to it if I had to, and the company needed me to, but you know, I didn't love it, but she does. Well, people like I'm you and I, so glad. To, yeah. People like you and I have to have folks follow behind us and clean up. <laughs> yes. We're really good initiators and really bad completers. Yeah. And so, but that's okay because the initiators are the ones that go out there and blaze the trail. That's right. And uh, the, the completers are the folks that, that, that make sure that what we created is actually turned into wealth. Yeah. But we got to have both. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about what you've been thinking about the blockchain world. So what's been going on there? There's been some crazy dollars going back and forth and, yeah. and lots of scams happening also. Yeah. So like, what are your thoughts about it? I mean, is there, well, are there some really good necessary applications out there? Uh, oh, absolutely. There's oodles and oodles of great applications out there. The thing to keep in mind is you got to, as I'm sure you said many times to your listener, you have to divorce uh, cryptocurrency from blockchain. And crypto is not blockchain, although crypto is part of the blockchain methodology. It's, it is just one application. Um, so we've talked about, you know, the three, the, the five V's. There's another aspect that you might think of too. And that is if you have the word broker in any part of your business, blockchain is going to disrupt that part of your business. Ah, uh, yeah. Because keep in mind, what does a broker do? They trust and verify. Uh, whether it's, um, brokering stocks or brokering um, the sale of anything or real estate brokers are going to be gone because once we blockchain uh, a lot of titles, we just won't need that title company. So it'll be a, a thing of the past. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're looking at ad brokers. We're disrupting ad brokers in a way. And so it's like, right if on. you think about the ad sales rep model Indeed. and you know, the interesting part is 
they don't even see it coming. No, they don't. They don't. Like it's, it, yeah, no, because I, because we talk about this model because we can do it today without the blockchain, which is basically we can put ads on any of your shows, right? So we can put it on the entire catalog and they go, well, that's be really nice, but we only sell the forward. Right. And I was like, so you don't want to make a hundred times more than you make now? Because I have more than a hundred episodes. No. That's right. No. I'm like, whoa. Gone. <laughs> You're ready to be gone. Right? They don't understand the concept of binge listening. Yeah. And people tell like, me they binge <laughs> listen to my show and I'm sure they do the same thing for your show. So yeah. let me let me rattle off a list of things that I think can be blockchain. This is probably Ooh, I love it. For some of your people. All right. Finance records, loans, stocks, bonds, insurance, academic degrees, employment history, resumes, information sources, reputation, licenses, deeds, wills, copyrights, patents, software, movies, music, games, computer security, emails, voicemails, currency, contracts, construction, collateral, real estate, cars, jewelry, relationships. Yes, even relationships. <laughs> Credit yeah, scores, historical records, genealogy, warranties, guarantees, government functions, trustee and notary functions, tax levies, tax payments. I think that's enough for now. <laughs> I love it. You know what? I did an interview on uh, luxury jewelry, Borsetta, one of my favorite companies. I think it's really up and coming. There's a lot of fraud there. Indeed. And that fraud really hurts the owner of whatever the piece might be. Well, and, and keep in mind that the Chinese have, have nailed lab-grown diamonds. Exactly. So, yeah. So, I love what she's doing there, um, Pamela Norton. And, I mean, it is just, it's, it's going to be a killer for luxury goods. And so, yep. that, that's one application I'm already seeing in play that's doing really well. And we can license plate every luxury good. We can go validate it with an, an app. And you'll know immediately if, if that beautiful Gucci bag that you just bought is, a, is the real deal or a, a third shift knockoff. Yeah. So you got Edison in the background. We were talking about that before. Yeah. Edison's in the background. Although he's a little dark right now with the lighting, but you look gorgeous. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but we, you know, this is also an area because you and I come out, you know, out of a world of like, you know, lots of innovation and lots of, of inventors and technology and things that end up patentable. And, and you mentioned that in the process, but you know, that is one thing that I think, you know, when we look at creatives, artists, whether it's music artists or any of those um, areas where somebody's inventing something we there is a lot of problems with value filtering down like I mean part of the reason I don't have a design business anymore is collecting royalties was a nightmare mm -hmm. so you do a royalty deal and you can't verify that the sales happened you can't collect your checks and you, you end up cheated so often out of it it makes it not worth it so then what do you do you go to fee based and no one can afford you that's right. And so, yeah. And so it became a no longer a viable business for me. And we started to move into 3D printing and other things that we could control. And, and so I would love to see that blockchain applications where they really return the ability to have residual value, whether it's the payment structure, smart contracts, going through to make sure that, that those that have ideas, that the creatives get, get valued for what they've put in. And that's actually a fairly simple thing to do, given yeah. the smart contracts and the fact that every time you play a, a song, the player goes out and pings the blockchain and finds out if you have the right to play it, and then also provides the, uh, the, 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 the author a, a, a nick. Yeah, they get, their, they get their cut. Yeah. They get their cut right here and now. Yeah. And it'll take us a little while to pivot to that, but I also see that um, that is inevitable. And in the world where we used to, um, we used to buy physical media CDs and DVDs, uh, it was easy for us to get royalties and count royalties. In this world of everything's digitized, it's a little more challenging. Yeah. Yet, yet we can embed in every song released, every movie released, its unique license plate. Yeah. And we can tell very quickly whether a particular uh, a piece of media is is owned by a person or rented by a person or leased by a person, and we can fix that royalty thing. It'll be a little while. We'd have some legislation that'll have to happen. But I, I see that as inevitable over time. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just found out because my son-in-law did, did a music video this last, past week. Um, that Very featured, cool. Yeah, he did it. Well, he, he's been doing many of them for hip hop artists, but this is the sort of first more mainstream. So it's Megan Trainer's song um, and it's dancers from So You Think You Can Dance or something like that. So they're dancing to her song, but because it's, 
it's music. You can't just put it up on YouTube without going through a specific company agency that has to authorize it. So you're going through a broker in order to get YouTube to put it up and not take it down. Yep. And so because their, their bots would automatically take it down. And so that's, and it was an eye opening to me to see how that process worked. And I thought, there's somebody who's going to be disruptive in the short term. You know, it's going to happen because that is difficult. It means that you can't self-publish without then enrolling in and belonging to this organization and going through this agent to make it happen for you. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah it's called a mechanical license and you have to have it if you use somebody else's music. Yeah. And the same thing, if you're going to play somebody else's music, you have to get a license from ASCAP or BMI or CSAC to have the rights to perform that music. And now those are perfect places for blockchaining and actually automation through apps to manage that because we have not only the geographic location of the play, but also the other time duration that can then be uh, steered back to a smart contract. So all those are opportunities to create extraordinary uh, outcomes. Now, you, a little early, you say, what would this event be like? And let me give you a couple of ideas what the event would be like. So first of all, you have to explore the business of blockchain. What does the business look like? We talk about business models, financial models, some applications, product services. We talk about development models. So how do you go about developing it? And then go to market models, deployment models, and some other enhancements. So we would spend a lot of time talking about business models. I love talking about business models because yeah. business models determine how we make money. And business models are made up of business rules. Now, the really great thing about blockchain is it allows us to create and enforce business rules automatically with smart contracts and other aspects of it. Uh, if you want to increase your revenues, you change your business model. If you increase your profits, you change your business model, your business rules. So we would talk about business rules. And then, you know, I, I want to stop you right there because I, you know, I think this is really important because there aren't a lot of places in which we can get information on models on how to build a blockchain, what my process needs to be, what my tools are, what, every, what the team members are. So when you look at that, there aren't a lot of places because it hasn't happened quite enough yet because right. it's new. So we need to know what models is it similar to that have been done elsewhere. And so that's something you can bring great perspective to because you've done this so much. Indeed. And, and part of it is going to be what I mentioned earlier, if a broker model is one business model that will allow us to create things. And then there's a lot of other models that were yet to be invented. We were talking about Thomas Edison. Well, his light bulb created a new business model and that is called generators and electrical distribution. So in some of these ways, we're going to generate new business models along the way. Yeah. And then uh, we'll talk about what investors and executives uh, have to consider as they conduct due diligence on project investments and what they're going to say yes to, what you got to show them. Now, keep in mind that CEOs are looking three to five years out. So you can actually do some long-term projects if they see that this is going to disrupt their competition or is required for them to stay into business for the long haul. So we're going to look at um, the horizons of innovation, which you and I have talked about in the past and how to fit blockchain into those horizons. So that's a critical component of it. Next is business model pivots. If you're going to introduce blockchain into your business, you're going to necessarily pivot your business model. So what's gonna change, what's gonna stay the same? For example, finance, operations, culture can change because of blockchain. Ethics can also change with blockchain. Uh, so that's an interesting conversation about, uh, about that. And of course, if you're part of this, we're going to be discussing how this applies specifically to you and your company. Then we want to explore the blockchain and adjacent technology. So let's find out what blockchain is going to plug into, such as artificial intelligence or Internet of Things, uh, mobility. With 5G turning on, blockchain is going to be a, a big part of the deployment of lots and lots of content with 5G streaming to 1 to 20 gig to your device. Really extraordinary. And then smart cities, uh, smart yeah. Smart houses, smart buses, smart schools um, are going to be a part of that. Uh, wait until we start doing implants and become cyborgs. <laughs> yeah, man, it's out there. Oh, it's, it's, clo it. it's, it's close. Oh, yeah, it's not too far away. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of things at, at, at CES. You were at CES this year, as was I. And uh, we, we've got, we're not that far away from implantables. 
No, no. I mean, I, you know, when people were talking 3D printed organs and I, you know, when I was, I was down in San Diego when they were doing the ear with the implant for, they were rebuilding an ear with the implant already in it. And I was like, wow, we are really not far at all. Yeah, indeed. And of course the millennials, they'll be glad to uh, tattoo and pierce anything. <laughs> so, you know, they're already okay with body modification, which means that implants are, that's a yes to a lot of people and even boomers. Hey, they get, all kinds of things implanted, such as pacemakers. <laughs> yes, yes, that is happening. So then, um, then we would, uh, you know, we want to take a look at what else, what can be exploited commercially, and uh, and we're going to explore that. And then business models, you know, what business models are going to get disrupted, replaced, and augmented by blockchain would be part of that conversation. And this is where I think a lot of companies can't afford not to have somebody be thinking about this because even if you are not, if blockchain is not in your future vision right now, you should be aware of what's going on because it could be disrupting your vision that you think you have. Well, if you're a business that has any digital component to it, then you've got to pay attention to blockchain and you've got to pay attention to 5G technologies. Uh, 5G <laughs> technology is going to so be, be so disruptive. And there is an, uh, some really interesting opportunities that are coming forth uh, with 5G that's going to drive blockchain adoption. Yeah. And may I, may I share that idea with you? Yeah, please. And, you know, I think you're so right, though. This is the one thing that I do want to say is when I was doing, conducting a lot of top level interviews over the last, uh, I don't know, five, six months that I've been doing that, the, the one thing that I get is a, the naysayers are really strong that blockchain has no place in it. Google's going to live forever, like these kinds of things. And I'm sitting back thinking, wow, you really are not open about what might be happening right under your nose. <laughs> well, I always take a look at naysayers as I do about futurists and say, how good is your record? <laughs> yeah, very right? good point. And you know, I have, I have some really interesting elements that I plug into my crystal ball that allow me to be very accurate with my predictions. Sometimes I'm off on the timeline, but as far as the predictions themselves, they've worked out really well. And one of those, of course, is Moore's Law, the fact that technology doubles every 12 to 18 months, which makes, which makes blockchain more and more attractive every year that goes by. Right. Uh, the other is that uh, we're seeing substantial increases in compute power, uh, which makes blockchain so much less expensive. Uh, and, and then the one I want to share with you around 5G. So uh, just a quick recap. 5G is the next generation of cellular connection technology. The big deal there is sub-millisecond ping, which means uh, that you have essentially instant load times for pages. And you have one to uh, 20 gigabit to your device, which is faster than most people have to their house and actually more bandwidth than that most corporate data centers have to the internet. Right. And it's just massive. Another interesting aspect is that our mobile devices that will be running on 5G, not the first generation, but probably second or third, will have month-long battery life. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Indeed. <laughs> Amazing. So my, I have, you know, I work at raising a generation. So I have nine and a four-year-old and almost 10 and almost five, right? And the two of them, I swear, it's like every device is always out of power and it is a crisis. The world is ending. <laughs> right. I mean, you know how that is, right? <laughs> they'll plug in their mobile phone before they'll go get food. <laughs> yes. Well, it's right now at, 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 at 10 and five, practically, we cannot get them to plug anything in. And like, <laughs> even, until we could get them, that is your responsibility. Like, that is our number one goal. But otherwise, Tom and I are scrambling around at the house at night going, is everything plugged in? Because we don't need to hear it tomorrow morning. <laughs> That's really good. That's so good. Well, with, with 5G, what's going to happen is we're going to have an adoption of a technology called containers. And containers are essentially the ultimate in virtualization for compute power. So right now, most, most computer centers run virtualized uh, servers, which are the compute power heavy lifting. And what happens is we take a piece of hardware and we can put 20 or different, 20 different virtual servers in there. It's soft, they're soft machines. And we have soft storage and we have soft networking. And the container puts all that into a single software unit. So if I have an application running in a container, I can run it in a data center, I can run it on a cell tower, I can run it on my mobile phone, I can run it anywhere that there's compute power. And what that allows me to do is very rapidly move where an application runs for, for either uh, massive numbers of people or doing it per personally. Well, how do we get paid for that container? That's where blockchain comes into play. So we'll use blockchain to, to pay for the compute power for the storage and the networking 
and will also use blockchain to pay for the license to run whatever application is inside that container. An example would be right now, many people use salesforce.com, but they're using it on Salesforce's servers. So in the future, you'll be running your Salesforce instance within your own container. And what that allows you to do is move it around so that you're independent of Salesforce. And if something goes down or if you lose networking, you still keep your business operational. So that's a business continuity strategy, but it requires blockchain so everybody gets paid. Right. And, 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 you know, I can see that as being also, you know, highly valuable in security systems and other things that it's going to keep working through. Yeah. love that. Exactly. I agree with you. I think this, I, I think that that's, there's a reason, there's an infrastructure reason that blockchain is going to force itself into almost all areas of the way that we work on and, and utilize the internet today and utilize our devices today. That's exactly right. And then the reality, a lot of it's going to be the key to the software apps that are going to be running, especially high value apps. So, for example, Oracle's offered containerization of their databases for, for three years now. It's been around. You know, it, this is not new technology. IBM just bought Red Hat, and they bought Red Hat for the container technology. So we're, we're getting a little geeky here, but I think it's really important for our listening to understand that there are many things in play right now that are going to set us up for a blockchain explosion. And the naysayers can say whatever the hell they like. Go ahead and retire. Go ahead and be a Luddite. Don't care. Blockchain is an important part of our future. Yeah, I agree. Well, the, Monica, Mark, and I would like to invite you to converse with us about the necessity for the summit, your ideas for, you know, what you'd like to see, what you're interested in. So make sure you communicate with us. But if you're in, if you're interested in having this type of executive summit, specifically focused on businesses that are exploring or are even already putting, stepping their toes into the blockchain and want to really get that outward vision three to five years, we want you to communicate back with us and let us know. No, because um, we're pretty serious about wanting to sponsor this and, and get this going. And we, maybe the timing could be upgraded if you guys are really interested. So we want to we make sure we're, we're communicating with all of you on that. Yes, indeed. And my, my proposal is we do it in Las Vegas. Aha, uh-huh, yeah, because that's where Mark is located. <laughs> it's not all that far from me. And why not? Because it's fun there. Indeed. And besides that, I have the perfect venue that will allow us to live stream Ooh. They have the bandwidth to live stream, and, and I'm sure that we'll have a lot of people that would like to join us in person, but also live stream. And, and, and what I'm proposing that. Is- that would be great because you know what? So many businesses today, it's really hard to take a full amount of time out of your business to travel somewhere and do it. So being able to virtually do it would be awesome. Although, you know, coming and taking two days to, as an executive to stop and put together your blockchain strategy would have a lot of opportunity, uh, yeah. a, a lot of value to you. Yeah, you have to look at that as an accelerator, right? That's an an accelerator model. Yeah, exactly. Well, Mark, I am so, I always enjoy our conversation together and I just love that we can get together and talk on all our shows because I think we've made that happen everywhere so far. We have, indeed. (laughs) So I absolutely love that. So is there anything else you want our audience to know before I go? And before- And and, indeed, uh, one of which is, if you'd like to explore the Executive Strategy Summit now, um, I'll hold it about every six weeks or so. Uh, and so executive strategy summit.com and um, we'll and have the I, links in the, in the new trust economy.com website. So that if you are driving, don't write this down, please. If you're driving, we'll get it. To you. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. We're just at, say, Hey Siri, executive strategy summit.com. There you go. Um, that'll do it too. And I want you and Tom to come because uh, oh, we're fun. actually, actually probably you and Alexandra come because you know, <laughs> She's the C- CEO COOs together actually work really well in this organization because you've got the strategic person, the tactical person, both speaking the same language after the end of the summit. So, Oh my gosh, that would be really good if we spoke the same language because I think I frustrate her. <laughs> and she frustrates you and we actually dig into that. Well, she, she, yes, exactly. <laughs> that it's, happens. It's part of what we, it's part of what part we explore. Of exactly. Well, I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that invite. So anyway, everyone, Mark S.A. Smith, he's been awesome. I knew you guys would love him. And, um, and so, but you can reach out to him because all his information is in the blog post for New Trust Economy. But I also really do. I mean, it's one of my favorite shows selling disruption show uh, it just made my top list on tribalist if you didn't see it Ooh, thank yeah. you that's awesome. right so we're creating some new lists of things and so um and tribalist has my best business growth podcast list
first. Oh, well, that's the first one I put up. And yep, you're on it because selling disruption is so critically important. So you've got some great guests on your show. And I just really want to make sure our listeners tie into that, especially if you're in that executive leadership and that exec executive level. There's or if you want to be. If you want to be, exactly. <laughs> if you want to yeah, get to both. that level. It's both. Listen, listen to learn. And if you're there, I've got lots of ideas. I've got really fantastic guests, including you. Yeah, thank you. And Tom. Yeah, he's been on it too. So absolutely. Well, thank you, Mark. We really appreciate it. And everyone, this has been the New Trust Economy. Until next time.